Hello again, witches, seekers, and friends, and welcome to the Fat Feminist Witch Podcast, the show where we do a little ranting, raving, and wand waving. I'm your host, Paige Vanderbeck, and together we're going to explore magic and spirituality, social justice, the psychic realm, and truly modern witchcraft. Hello again, my witchy friends, and a very happy Halloween to all of you. Thank you for joining me again for my annual Big Fat Feminist Halloween special. Every year around this time, I like to examine some of the stories and tropes, images and stereotypes about witches, and how they've woven themselves into our Halloween celebrations. The witches we see around Halloween are mostly a European and North American creation, as is Halloween itself, which I spoke about in my previous episode. But not everything about the holiday comes from European customs or even Canadian or American ones. Around the world, people have different practices and beliefs surrounding death and fear and monsters that we love to explore at Halloween. And we don't always know where they actually come from or their significance in their culture of origin. A particular type of horror monster whose origins I've always wanted to learn more about are zombies. Now, I'm not actually a big zombie movie fan, but that's mostly because there is no origin for zombies <laughs> given in a lot of the movies that we watch. Zombieism and its ensuing apocalypse, of course, are presented as something that just happens. You know, maybe it's a virus, or maybe it's a crazy thing that suddenly happens with no explanation, a chemical spill, who knows? Even some pioneers in the industry, like George Romero, who created the original Night of the Living Dead, say over and over that what created the zombies doesn't actually matter. The story is more about the people who have to survive in this harsh world that looks to harm you at every turn. A lot of modern zombie films serve as an allegory for for a bunch of different societal issues, like capitalism and its its destruction of our way of life, you know, destroying civilized society as we know it, and robbing people of their humanity. And while all of those messages are, are very powerful, and I watched a lot of zombie documentaries to prepare for this episode, and they were all very interesting. The question of, yeah... But those are like reanimated corpses. How does that happen? Is one that I just can't ignore. I want to know how that happened. It's not just literally about how those, you know, those dead bodies are are physically able to move. Like, it's not so much about that. But how or why someone would do this? Why would someone create the virus, the drug, the, the whatever that makes this happen? Since the how is often very vague or deemed literally unimportant, the why is also something I never see in those movies. Well, not never, but very infrequently. Sometimes it's just very, very vague. You know, it's a mistake happened and here we are. No one knew this would happen. But when you go back in time a little bit to some of the very first zombie movies in the 30s and 40s, You see how and especially why someone would intentionally zombify another person. And the reasons how and why are a big plot point in the story. And that's because while modern zombie films put the science in science fiction, zombies were originally created with magic by quote-unquote voodoo priests, as they say in Hollywood, for the purposes of enslaving a specific person for a specific purpose and reason, both in films and in real life. Zombie mythology did not spring to life fully formed on the silver screen or even in books. It is actually a very real type of magic in Haitian voodoo, as opposed to voodoo, which is a name applied to a lot of other African traditional religions, and also a word that in Hollywood has been used to stigmatize a lot of these religions. Zombies in this original form were not reanimated corpses, but people who had been drugged or spelled, cast magic upon, to appear as if they were dead. And after they were buried, they were dug up, woken by a priest, usually beaten, and then taken to a location far from home where they worked in things like sugar mills or on farms as indentured servants. 
Since that person was legally dead, they couldn't reclaim their lands, their possessions, or even just go home again, as they'd be feared and ostracized. Think about it, would you be really excited to see someone 10 years after you attended their funeral? I think that might freak you out. It was a way to get rid of someone without granting them the sweet release of death, which is pretty scary. So how did white people from outside of Haiti, outside of the Vodou religion, learn about zombies? Of course, it's from anthropologists and writers, many of whom were white, who visited the island and wrote about their experiences, whether they were legitimate or not. <laughs> These books were turned into films, like White Zombie, starring Bela Lugosi in 1932, which featured a bunch of racist tropes and stereotypes, and even put the power to create zombies into the hands of white characters from the very cultures that had enslaved Africans and brought them to Haiti in the first place. I think the overt racism of, of these films colored our perception of zombie movies that featured voodoo or other magic. And so that element was just dropped from the zombie story over time. But zombie movies continued shuffling forward, <laughs> even without voodoo. While it's good that no one is making really overtly racist modern, like, black exploitation films featuring voodoo surf zombies from outer space or, like, whatever... Although now that title is just, like, the best. Now I would watch that movie. Uh, while it's probably pretty good that no one is making movies like that anymore, the consequences of that decision are that very few people actually know the origins of their, you know, their favorite Halloween movie monster. I spoke to a lot of fans of zombie films and TV shows of the science fiction variety who knew nothing about African traditional religions. They were, they were not spiritual people. They were movie fans. And while many of them knew that these, these old zombie movies had these voodoo storylines, they didn't know why there were voodoo zombie movies. They didn't know there was any sort of thread connecting it to reality. So this Halloween, we're going to look at zombies and the religion and the culture that created them. To help me get it right, I've invited Lilith Dorsey to join me on the episode. Lilith is the author of many books on African-American spirituality. She's a musician and a dancer, a filmmaker, and an actual practitioner of African traditional religions, including voodoo and La Regla Lukumi, which is formerly known as Santeria. Her most recent book release is called Voodoo and African Traditional Religion, and it is a fantastic compendium of information on many different religions. I honestly had no idea there were so many. And more importantly, it helps you understand why those religions are so important, so vital, and so fulfilling for those who practice them. This is most definitely a five crystal ball rated book. And if you have ever been interested in learning more from an authentic source on this topic, I honestly cannot recommend it enough. This isn't the first time Lilith has been on the show. <laughs> in 2016, she came on to talk about her book, Love Magic, which is, again, it's the first book that I recommend when someone asks about Love Magic. Uh, and I still get feedback from a lot of you guys saying how much you love your her episode, you love her voice, her books. So I know that you guys are all just as excited as I am for today's topic and to have her here with me. Since Lilith herself is a musician and a dancer, as you'll hear her mention in this episode, I will be putting out a B-side of this episode this weekend before Halloween so that you can hear some music, some of which are personal recommendations from her and ones that I found recommended in some of her other books. I chose music made by Black people and or practitioners of African traditional religions or that feature zombies specifically. So if you're a big music fan, you know, keep an eye out for that tomorrow. But for now, without further ado, let's get to my conversation with Lilith Dorsey about zombies and African traditional religions. Thank you so much, Lilith Dorsey, for being on the show today. I'm so excited to have you here. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. This is one of my favorite shows and you're one of my favorite people. So like, it is the season, right? Like, let's get talking. Yeah, thank you so much, Lilith. Your books are, I mean, they're all incredible. Every time I, I get a new one, I'm like, this can't possibly as, be as good as the last one was. Um, but they're they're fantastic. Uh, last year we read um, 
Arisha's Goddesses and Voodoo Queens in, in my book club. And I mean, everyone loved it and everyone learned a whole bunch of new things that they had ever heard, that they had never really heard before. Wow, and, that's uh, fantastic. Yeah, it was, it was really great. You know, there's, um, for those listening, we're talking a little bit about African traditional religion today, um, in addition to a, a very particular piece of magic from Haitian Vodou. Uh, but before we get into that, I'd love to talk a little bit about African traditional religions, because there is so much that those from the outside, they don't know, and that they, they would love to learn more about. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that, you know, Western slash European tendencies to think of Africa as a monolith and African Mm -hmm. traditional religion as a monolith. And there's really so many different types and variations and permutations of the religion that's informed both by where it came from in Africa and where it manifested in the Caribbean or South America or all of those things. So, you know, that's what I talk about a lot in my new book and just sort of what the differences are, what the similarities are like, oh, well, I'm part Haitian. Maybe I want to know about Haitian Vodou, but I'm mm-hmm. also part Cuban or my partner's Cuban. And I want to learn about Santo or La Regla Lacumi in Cuba. So I think it's nice to have it all together and because it's very complicated (laughs) it's uh it's a lot they're very involved religions which is still great there's a lot of really great stories and a lot of interesting just a lot of interesting practices that aren't so common in in more european-based magical practices right Definitely, definitely. Yeah. I think it's it's even a, a completely different way of thinking, mm-hmm. you know, since it's this time of year where we talk a lot about the dead, it's a different way about dealing with the dead and dealing with ancestors mm-hmm. and beloved dead that I don't think, again, is, is something that's familiar to a lot of people who grew up with Western concepts. You're, you're absolutely right about that. The, our feelings about death are, there are this wide difference. Um, between a lot of other cultures um, of color, but especially many of these African traditional religions and more European and North American ways of thinking. You know, we're so afraid of death. We do everything we can to avoid death, to avoid being near death, to avoid even looking at death. You know, when we have open casket funerals, that person is made to look alive, quote unquote, though I I never think they do. No, they never do. It's it's weird. It's weird, I tell you. Right. And we're not really encouraged to, you know, talk to the dead, to to have anything to do with the dead. Even um visits to cemeteries and, and graveyards are I mean, they're much they happen much less now within these European uh traditions. They just happen much less. People want to avoid the graveyard. Definitely. I feel like it used to be, especially, you know, a hundred years ago, it used to be somewhere that people would go and have a picnic on Sunday. You know what I Mm -hmm. mean? And they would still incorporate that into their lives. And in African traditional religions, there's usually an ancestor altar or shrine that's up in someone's home. There's daily offerings for initiates that they do, you know, so it really is this kind of remembering them on a daily basis and still incorporating them into your life, even though they're not physically still there right right it's this beautiful connection to to the past and to all the people that you know created the traditions that you're still practicing with yeah yeah I mean I we have to know where we came from to know where we're going right like that's Mm -hmm. what they say so if and and they have things that we can still you know draw on and learn today I mean so much of what I think everybody's been going through with this pandemic is realizing that, you know, our ancestors have gone through these kinds of trials and tribulations before they've had to deal with death and illness. And I remember my grandmother telling me a story once about how she made dinner for her whole family. She made a roast chicken dinner when Mm she was four years old. (laughs) I always thought, wow, that's crazy. But thinking back on it now, that must've been during the 1918 pandemic, you know? Right. And uh, she had to cook because everybody was way too sick to get out of bed and take care of things. She's such a Virgo, you know? So, uh, <laughs> Even at a young age, she was such a Virgo. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm in charge. I got this, you know? <laughs> That's so fantastic. I, I love that I story. Um, right? I love that story. That's so wonderful. And and yeah, there's that um, something I noticed, this thread that that connects 
many of these religions is this real community vibe. You guys are working together, you're connecting to each other and you're connecting to, you know, to the spirits, to the deities, to the ancestors. It's this, this whole connection to other people um, that again is, is kind of separate in many witchcraft traditions where we're allowed to just, you know, go solo and make things up as we go along. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there really is no self initiation, you know, there's a lot of horror stories about people who have tried, you know, and things like that. It's, there are some very real types of magic and spellcraft and formulas and things like that. And, and like anything, you have to know what you're doing. So you don't end up in dangerous territory. It's very easy to make things worse if you don't have mm -hmm. that guidance, which is why we have godparents, why we have god brothers and sisters. And when we join a spiritual family, it really is a family, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes that doesn't always look the way we want it to, but hopefully it looks the way we need it to, you yeah. know, and, and we can get what we need out of it and we get what we put into it, really. But there is a, a level of dedication, I think, that, again, is something that's hard for people to understand. You know, it's not just we get together on Sabbaths or we get together, yeah. you know, on Saint Days. You know, we do, although there is some sort of blending of, uh, you know, traditions there because that's what slaves were forced to do. And enslaved people, you know, had these kinds of Catholic and, and Christian mm -hmm. imagery, but we do still have, again, like I mentioned, daily offering ceremonies that have to be done when someone has passed, you know, that are very different, I think, than what most mainstream witches are looking at these days. Absolutely. Uh, so Voodoo and African Religion, which just came out, it was just released, was it earlier this year? Or late last year? Yes, it was in <laughs> June. And this is actually a reprint of your very first or one of your first books. Um, why did you think that this, this needed to be re-released now? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, well, it was out of print, technically. Mm. Um, not out of print where they gave me the rights back and I could have reprinted it myself. That mm -hmm. was a very long struggle to get the rights back. But uh, people were paying $800, $900 <sighs> for it online. And I was like, okay, I will sit on your lap and read it to you for $900. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's up with that. Because I don't see any of that. You know, you're an author. You know, you don't see right. any of that. You see nothing. So, um, <laughs> but it was more about, honestly, it was more about the information and getting that out there that I wanted people to have this very intro basic information because so many more people are trying to discover stuff about the African traditional religions. Mm -hmm. So it was really, I wanted to get it reprinted. And as soon as I got the rights back, I wanted to get it reprinted as quickly as possible. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. There's, uh, there are so many more of these African traditional religions than I was totally aware of, so many more. And they're all, I mean, although there are some similarities all the way through, they're all very different, very unique to both the places in Africa where, um, you know, the original people came from and also the places where they're being practiced now. I mean, there's such a difference between you know, for example, how some in Cuba celebrate or practice La Regla Lukumi or, or Santeria as it used to be called, and how someone in, you know, say California in LA practices it. There's, there's much of a difference because of their current cultural traditions, I guess you could say. Yeah. And I mean, I think today it's become even more confused because you can certainly have people from Cuba traveling to Miami or Los Angeles or mm -hmm. all over the globe, really, to help initiate. So you've got the original thing. You've got the practitioners experience where they are and the indigenous practices of the land. And then you've got the language differences as well, mm -hmm. which I think, you know, speaking Haitian Creole is very different than speaking Louisiana Creole is very different mm -hmm. than speaking Spanish from Cuba, Spanish from Puerto Rico. It's all different, you know? So how you frame things, how you think about things is shaped by the language. So this is something again, that I think people don't think about. Yeah. Uh, I I think you're right about that. I really do think you're right about that. I um, I was struck with especially the names of, of the deities, of the gods, of the spirits. You see that many of them are very similar. They have this very similar name, but the way they say it and what that means uh, in their language, in their current culture is it's a little bit different for all of them. 
they they really change Definitely. with the face of the people practicing. Definitely. I mean, even if you look at something like in Brazil, there's candomblé, there's umbanda, there's, you know, variations of spiritism, you know, mm -hmm. so it's a sociocultural thing. In some cases, it goes according to race lines, but then the practices are very different because it's different people, you know. Right. Absolutely. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about voodoo. Voodoo is not, there is not just one version of voodoo. There are many different versions of voodoo. So what exactly is kind of maybe the main um, idea or belief of, of voodoo across these different uh, practices? I mean, I think voodoo for a long time was something that was stereotyped and a mm -hmm. Hollywood thing. And obviously we're going to get into more of that later. But here in New Orleans, there was a reclaiming of the word, I feel, to a large extent, because it is such a heavy tourist industry and things like that. And, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, in Haiti, there's definitely a shift especially now towards more speaking Creole and what's practiced there is voodoo and what's practiced in New Orleans is voodoo. So let me just make that clear from the mm -hmm. beginning. But the word derives from some linguists say, not all linguists, but some linguists have theorized that it comes from just the word for spirit or divinity or deity. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with that kind of connection to the higher powers that are out there and worshiping them in a very real and present way. They're associated with, connected with, represented by almost the same thing as some of the natural forces. If we look at somebody like Erzuli Frida and the power of the waterfall in Haiti, that is the sacred energy of the waterfall, the feeling that someone gets when they're being, you know, washed off by the waterfall, when they're sitting next to a waterfall, but also that character of love and beauty and joy and transformation, all of that comes together with Erzuli as well. In New Orleans, in our voodoo practice because the city is such a spiritual gumbo mm -hmm. we incorporate Haitian loa from voodoo we incorporate um, in La Regla Lakumi the Orisha that they worship there there's even some people you know end up being these sort of deified characters from the city mm -hmm. as Dr. John would say that have their own spiritual mojo their own spiritual power and they continue to be worshipped you know after death absolutely um, I loved I loved your section on Marie Laveau in um, in Orisha's Goddesses and Voodoo Queens for that reason. It's it's so interesting to see this this person. I mean, I wouldn't call her a regular person. She was kind of a a really incredible, exceptional person. But to see her deified, you know, people genuinely worship Marie Laveau as as a as a spirit, an ancestor, a goddess, a deity, and I think that's really incredible. Oh, definitely. It's almost as if everybody in the city here in New Orleans has their own special connection to Marie Laveau, mm -hmm. you know, and it's so multi-layered and beautiful. And, and it's really wonderful that a lot of information has come to light, even in the past, you know, five or 10 years about yeah. her life. And, Absolutely. Uh, that's fascinating to me. So we can sort of put truth with fantasy and, and, and see, <laughs> <laughs> see where they line yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Where do they overlap? And uh, often they, uh, they overlap a lot. She was a really, she was a really cool, very magical person. <laughs> um, it was. Yeah. So New Orleans is voodoo is this is the one that most of us here in North America are at least a little familiar uh, with some of it is movie stereotype. Some of it is that that is a little bit more, you know, accessible to some of us. But Haitian so. voodoo is, is just a little bit different. What are, what are the difference between um, New Orleans voodoo and, and the Haitian voodoo? I mean, I think we're first of all starting with a, you know, language difference. We're mm -hmm. starting with that it's traditionally the religion in Haiti was responsible for the Haitian revolution. And there's mm -hmm. some speculation slash belief among Haitians that Jean-Jacques Dessalines, who was integral in the original Haitian revolution in the 1780s, I want to say I'm bad with numbers. I apologize mm -hmm. if that's wrong. But that's, about, uh, that's about the right time period, though. I know it was like the very late 1700s to the very yes. early 1800s. <laughs> yes. So, you know, I've had, again, Haitian priests and priestesses talk about he was connected to Ogun, connected to the religion, and there's rumors about some of the other leaders being connected to the religion. So because it allowed them to have that level of freedom, I think that, and also because after that point, they were still 
you know, occupied, unfortunately, by Europe right. and, and America and other places like that. But they did still have a somewhat level of autonomy because they were, you know, not colonized the way, say, Jamaica was or say even the other side of the island, the Dominican Republic was. Mm -hmm. So you've got variations in the tradition. You've got a language difference, like I said, with Creole. So in addition to being organized according to houses or, or Hufor, which is what they call them in Creole, and you have a, a godmother and a godfather who's seen as a mambo or the Hungan for that Hufor, and they are seen as spiritual parents, and you have initiations, and a lot of time is spent really in the Hufor being part of the community, and that's how it was always done. But the overall arching structure is also organized according to nations or nations, mm -hmm. which are people's lineage in the tradition. So again, this is something, glad you asked this today because I don't usually talk about this. So you have your own immediate spiritual family and then you have the larger expanded spiritual family, which you see in other African traditional religions, but it has a different name and a slightly different structure. Right. Yeah, it's a, like I said, it's a very, it's all very connected. You're connecting with each other, with the wider community and with spirit all at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's beautiful. It's beautiful that we can talk about it more. You know, when I first started talking about it, you mentioned that this book was a reprint. The original one came out in 2004 and people really didn't like to talk about things back then. There was a whole element of secrecy, both inside and outside the tradition. And mainly mm -hmm. that was to protect itself because there was so much hatred. There was so much loathing. I've been threatened lots of times, you know, both in person and, you know, online or whatever about, you know, my practices. And it's just, I, I think this again is something that people that are, are younger than I am and newcomers to the tradition don't realize how dangerous it was, both from the police and for other members of the community and for people who weren't practitioners and just full of hate. Yeah, absolutely. I um I remember that time period and I remember um when local people here were were practicing um their African traditional religion. I believe it was voodoo, but uh that's what I heard from the people who had a problem with it. You know, it was um they're practicing voodoo. That means they're doing something wrong, they're doing black magic, they're, you know, they believed all of the Hollywood stereotypes were really sure. what voodoo was. And these are like, these are not idiots. These are, these are, you know, relatively intelligent people who practice paganism or some other, you know, kind of alternative spirituality. And still yes. that mm -hmm. stereotype and that, that, of course, well, I mean that outright racist view, let's just say it was oh, fully yeah. present, fully present. Yes. 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 Right. And I think the first time I saw any sort of African traditional religion mentioned in um, books marketed to modern witches from like, you know, Llewellyn and those companies, uh, <laughs> it was a bit on, on Santeria by a white person who doesn't practice Santeria. <laughs> and it was, right. you know, it was a whole guide on, on worshiping um, Yamaya. And I just... Oh my God. I was so interested in it because it was so hard to find that information. And looking back, I'm like, oh gosh, this is awful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hate There's that that was all there was. There's some crappy stuff out there. Yeah. 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 I mean, I remember, again, no names, but I remember, you know, people would come and they'd have interactions and then they'd be like, oh, I, I met this person and then my cat died the next day. Like, there was always some sort of really <laughs> bad juju surrounding some of these things. And I was just right. like, what the hell? You know, even again, some of the early authors that came out in the 80s, I had what my goddaughter went to one of them for a reading not that long ago. They told her to go to uh, Central Park and put some rats on a stick. I was what? like, what is that? <laughs> oh, it's like you paid good money for that. Okay, what have we learned? Imagine you know. seeing someone doing that in Central Park. Like she she's the last person wow. who would do that. That's just yeah. That. That's just wow, that's wild. That is not advice I could yeah. actually take. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um Wow, that's that's amazing. Uh on that note, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about uh zombies in Haitian Vodou. So for listeners who don't know, even those zombie fans out there, zombie movie fans, the idea of zombies originally came from Haitian Vodou, as far as I know, possibly Africa, but they were 
a part of the practice, a legitimate part of the practice for quite some time. And what that led to is, oh, is a lot of strange, you know, more of these strange stereotypes applied to any sort of African traditional religion, this idea that they would zombify somebody, they would turn someone into a willing slave after raising them from the dead. Where exactly <laughs> did the idea of zombies and zombification come from? I mean, I think if we go back, we can see it in some of those, again, early Eurocentric kinds of anthropological investigations. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think today I'd call it cultural rape, probably. Mm -hmm. So if we look back at some of that, that we've got these sort of wild women of the swamp who, you know, conjure things and make herbal concoctions and, you know, it can terrify you. And, and I, I mentioned earlier this kind of isolation that Haiti had. So that mm -hmm. afforded them this way of having a stereotype that they could throw onto it that was going to be, to a large extent, you know, not able to be challenged in in academia in media because you know people ain't trying to hear that you know they want to hear that oh these are the wild natives that yeah. are so different than us and they do crazy things whereas the reality of it is that they had spiritual formulas the same way that we have spiritual formulas today and these formulas from people that reported on them were you know variations of herbs and things like that that would produce temporary paralysis i have heard some people say that it included, you know, the Jap a relative of the Japanese puffer fish that mm -hmm. could be found uh, in the Caribbean waters there around Haiti and Jamaica that would allow somebody's heart rate to, to be slowed. And, and if somebody was being very objectionable in the community, you know, when I've seen it reported on, it was somebody who was a thief, somebody who was a child molester, somebody mm -hmm. who was, you know, a bad person and uh, detriment to the community. And you couldn't necessarily go to the police because maybe they were corrupt and you couldn't necessarily go to the government because maybe they were dishonest and you needed to have a social control for these people. So what you had was an herbal one that would allow them to mimic death, their family and everybody else would think they were dead. And then after the funeral, you would transport them to another town, another place on the different side of the island, and there they would become field hands or some sort of, you know, indentured servant. Yeah. And their memory would be foggy and uh, they'd suffer some sort of minor brain damage as a result of this. That's so, like, that's so extreme. It's so intense. It's such a, like a seriously, um, it's such a, it's such a powerful way to like solve that problem. It, it, it involves so many steps, you know, it's, it seems so much more than just killing somebody, <laughs> which seems so permanent, but they took it this, this extra step as a, was it a form of, of punishment to that person? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think it was a form of both protection and punishment, like all good magic is, you know what I mean? Absolutely. And uh, especially if somebody's wronged you, you know what I mean? It's not willy nilly, oh, like, you know, whatever. This was something that was, I believe, you know, to a large extent, something of last resort, you know, and something that also served as a social control because it was a threat that, you know, once you knew somebody knew how to do this, you wouldn't cross them. You wouldn't, you know, go after their grandkids or try and steal stuff out of their house. No, not at all. You'd be like, Absolutely oh, this not. person knows this secret, so I'm going to stay away from them. You know, I, I don't. And as you know yourself, there's a, a large range of herbal magics that, you know, mm -hmm. just don't get talked about. But because these people were in such an extreme situation, you know, because they were enslaved people, that they had to deal with colonization, that they had to deal with, even now, look at all the things that Haiti is still dealing with, that they right. needed a very strong magic and able to to in order to be able to survive all of that you know right it seems like such an it's such an extreme um a, a, an extreme course of action to those of us who literally cannot imagine being in that same situation like i have no idea how it feels 
to be a, a previously enslaved person whose freedom is still kind of tenuous. I have no idea. In that situation, could I see myself going to lengths like this? I mean, maybe. Absolutely, maybe. If it's about keeping oh, yourself safe, it's about, you know, keeping the whole community <laughs> safe. Like, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It seems a lot less extreme when you put it in that proper context. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. You know, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I could see myself doing that. Yeah, absolutely. I could. I mean, I've yeah. dealt with objectionable people in the community, you know. Yeah, and there's, I mean, in that extreme, way, like extreme reactions like that come from extreme prejudices, hatred, yeah. uh, other extreme behaviors and actions. Yeah. Like, that's just, it's, that's what you get. <laughs> I feel yeah. like it's responding appropriately at that point. Yeah. So zombies, when we think of zombies in movies, we think of it's a reanimated corpse. It's someone that was completely dead right. and buried and they've been raised from the dead, possibly like even 10 years later. Um, within Haitian voodoo, is this really what they were doing? Were they, were, were no. they reanimating corpses? No. 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 I've seen no evidence of that either in, you know, personal or professional study. No. Right. No, not at all. In some of the, the books I read for research, including uh, The Serpent and the Rainbow by Wade Davis, uh, he says the exact same thing, that it is a concoction, a, a poison, or a spell or, or magical ritual that can see, make someone appear as dead, and then they can right. be, you know, woken up from it and snatched out of their grave later. Which makes the idea of movie zombies, you know, eating flesh and eating brains and stuff, even more kind of ridiculous. Because there's no way a living person yeah. is just going to turn into a cannibal because of a poison. Where did that come from? Is that, was that a part of original zombie stories or mythology at all? Again, not that I know of. <laughs> I think this is a Hollywood uh, concoction, really. Yeah. You know? I, mean, I couldn't, I couldn't yes. find any evidence of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've got things with snakes. There's a lot of that. And there is that connection between, you know, some people think even the word zombie was a bastardization of Marie Laveau's snake, which is said to be named Simbi, which is one of the Haitian law for magic and communication and mm -hmm. transformation. And so you can see the connection there that this Absolutely. was an image of power. And again, because of linguistic differences, because of, you know, I think one of the things people don't realize is after the Haitian Revolution, there was a huge influx of Haitians to the New York city of New Orleans. Yeah. And I think the population increased somewhere between a third and a half. So we, like, it's, yeah, it's nuts. To that's think a lot about of people. That. Yeah, that's, like that's a lot of people. Yeah, that's a lot of people. And so what happened was there was this blending of practices. There was this blending of languages, as I just mentioned, the same way that Haitian Creole and Louisiana Creole are different languages today. They mm -hmm. were certainly different languages then. There was even more separation because it took, you know, you had to get on a boat. You had to, there wasn't the transportation that we have now. Right. So there wasn't the internet, all of these things, telephones. So there was misunderstandings happening. Happening. So I think that this word zombie evolved, it evolved into something meaning both magic and silence and transformation, which is something that Hollywood sort of glommed onto and made it into this undead image of something. And we see that with white zombie is the first real one where we see this kind of thing. And it just sort of becomes this symbol of this evil, dark other that has these strange powers over life and death. Yeah. White Zombie is, is interesting. I, I watched it the other day and I also just learned something kind of funny about it. Uh, so for those who don't know, White Zombie came out in 1930 and it starred Bella Lugosi as a voodoo witch doctor, quote unquote, um, who reanimates the dead, right? He, he kills them, he reanimates them and they become, uh, according to the, the literature, you know, his willing slaves. Um, and right at the beginning of the movie, uh, when our lead characters who are, who are white people first see zombies, quote unquote, the person who tells them what they are is a black man who is driving their coach. He's the pretty much the only black person that talks in the entire movie. Uh, and his entire purpose seems to be to tell them that they are zombies, that they are dead corpses and that they feast on human flesh. 
which as we just covered was not in zombie literature before that um but strangely the guy who wrote the book white zombie is made from did eat human flesh like (laughs) he um he visited africa and he he mentioned some random african tribe right that uh participated in ritual um cannibalism after after a battle he wasn't invited to join them (laughs) they didn't invite him to join at all because that was not a place for him so what he did was he went to a local hospital and he acquired human body parts and he cooked them himself which is so obviously this man is out of his mind right nuts first of all that's not the same thing i mean there's no there's there's none i question every part of this right the whole story sounds <laughs> nuts. The only part I believe is that this guy bought human remains and cooked them and ate him himself. Well, That's yeah. the only part that yeah. seems right. reasonable. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, so that is a really weird, just a really weird connection I found because there was no eating human flesh before that point. <laughs> so I'm wondering if, you know, he's, he's, he put that in there because he's a weirdo who thought eating human flesh was something he wanted to do. And as far as yeah, that, I've I've gone down a I've gone down a Bella Lugosi hole <laughs> in my brain. Well, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about his whole thing about how you know get he's got this commanding, compelling, mesmerizing presence, you know, mm-hmm. that we equate with him around Dracula and things like that. And then you know you've got Bram Stoker writing about Layer of the White Worm and this whole kind of like voodoo mystique kind of right. you know sacred serpent cults and things as well. So it, there was a lot of embellishment going on at this point. <sighs> <That's insane. laughs> yeah, the the bad part of that embellishment is maybe it made things a little more entertaining, but it certainly made things a little bit more difficult for you know black people or specifically, I mean, any sort of people who practice an African traditional religion, especially voodoo. I imagine that a lot of these very frightening stories and stereotypes had a pretty negative people on the practice, on the people who've been practicing since then. Is this still, is this still something that uh, voodoo practitioners deal with today? That they are, that people are afraid of things like zombification or too much with death? I think that there's, you know, that's one piece of the stereotype. I think it's it's part of the overarching thing about it being evil. You know, I, I yeah. did, I was just thinking, I forgot to say, I think it's really dubious that the beginning of White Zombie has the black guy co-signing this behavior. Mm-hmm. And I think this is still something that people look for, you know, black people to co-sign their bad behavior. Yeah. And that happens over and over again. And fortunately I've been doing some consulting lately, which makes me very happy that, you know, if somebody is going to have this as part of something they're writing or something they're filming, that they really should seek an actual practitioner to get advice from and, and, and advisement on so because the truth of the matter is is it is much more exciting and fantastic literally than some of this real trash that they're writing my priestess Mm -hmm. priestess miriam from the voodoo spiritual temple here in new orleans likes to say they like to drag things down to the lowest common denominator And, and that's what i feel like this whole preoccupation with zombies as an element of Haitian voodoo really is, you know, I mean, and I love zombies. Don't get me Mm -hmm. wrong. Like I love zombie movies. I watch stupid crap like Zomboat and (laughs) all that other stuff, you know? Oh man, bad and funny zombie movies are the way to go. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Yes. I find it very entertaining and I find it fascinating about what it says about culture as well, like Mm -hmm. in this kind of othering and and we fear a different version of ourselves, a version of ourselves that in some ways is more primal, is more, you know, uncontrollable. I think that you definitely get that with the zombies as a trope. I just wish it didn't have anything to do with voodoo because that particular thing, you know, doesn't. Right, right. It's uh, it's strange to me that zombies are still the word for this type of creature, even though they have almost nothing to do with voodoo zombies. You know, it, we don't see a lot of films featuring zombies that are made by supernatural means. Most of the time, it's something like a like a virus. It's it's a food they ate. It's a it's a it's just a horrible disease that's going around. We don't actually see a lot of times it made and created by magic, and the the times we do where 
you know, very long time ago. <laughs> and those movies are a little bit rough to watch because the racist stereotypes are over the top. No, it's true. It's yeah, true. It's, yeah. They're all over the top. Um, how did we, how did zombies lose their voodoo roots? You know, how did this happen? How did we go from, uh, you know, even something like white zombie to night of the living dead, where we have no explanation of how they got that way, but it wasn't magic. I think we need to think of Night of the Living Dead in the context of what it is, you know? I mean, zombies as a trope, you know, fall into this sort of horror fantasy, you know, almost sci-fi genre if we lump them all together because people, Mm -hmm. you know, as a film scholar, people do lots of times. And, you know, that coming out of the 60s where we were dealing with this kind of uncontrollableness, right? Age of Aquarius, let it all hang out. You Mm -hmm. know, and we've got the Vietnam War and we've got, you know, civil unrest here at home among Black people and things like that. So that, I think we could have these things really as a social commentary that this trope of zombies allowed them to have this scenario where we were talking about things being unleashed, things being uncontrolled. And and it really is the protagonist, the Black man in Mm -hmm. that film that saves us all, you know, like absolutely hippies again. So this is kind of alternative force that's able to control the mad masses that are, you know, trying to attack us and kill us and, and all of that. So I think that's where we end up, where it's moving away from that, because we needed it to say something that it didn't. And that was not, oh my God, get $10 million, Hollywood's going to make yeah. this movie. That movie was, oh, we're going to struggle so hard <laughs> to make this movie. So that's how that movie got out. You know, I think if Hollywood had put on a movie, it would have been very different. Yeah. One of the ones that I always talk about, and I do talk about this in my books, I talk about Sugar Hill, which is one of the black exploitation films where she's got zombies that sort of come to her aid. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. I, <laughs> I read about it in your book and Voodoo and African Traditionals. I'm looking for the movie now. Like I have not been able to track it down, but. Um... Oh my gosh, you have to watch it. I feel like it's on YouTube or pieces of it are on YouTube. It's got to be hilarious. somewhere else. It's, gotta be it's hilarious. She does. She's got these legions of zombies and Harlem. And but for me, it's not only like yes, black exploitation was a genre. It was a thing. But again, it was kind of about empowerment in that moment. Yeah. And she could empower herself with this ancient knowledge of voodoo. And this is something you get later too. You get it in uh, Live and Let Die, the James Bond movie, mm-hmm. where. You've got Jeffrey Holder, who's actually a uh, from Trinidad and a priest in the tradition in Trinidad. I didn't you know, know that. That's prepared. very cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He worked with my uncle too, which I also think is fascinating. Very but I didn't realize cool. that until after he died. But um, so you've got him portraying it. So you know, and choreographing a lot of those numbers. So you've got this thing where we do have some bit of no, he didn't write it. Did he get paid enough for it? I certainly, probably, probably, definitely, not. no. Yeah. <laughs> probably did not get paid nearly enough but for his work. He, again, at least in some minor way, by portraying it, by being a practitioner, by having this kind of thing, even within the confines of Hollywood, we could provide a counter narrative and I think that the late 60s early 70s allowed us to do that and then we sort of regressed and now we're back on the right track with things like you know John and Hansu's In Search of Voodoo where we talk about the real practices that he grew up with in Benin Mm-hmm. in West Africa, where the, you know, some people ascribe the original roots of, of Haitian Vodou right. going through there. In my research these last, you know, whatever few weeks that I've been getting ready for this episode, I've never been a huge zombie movie fan. I don't hate it, but it's just, it's, they're not my movie monster, right? They're not my guy. Um, but I've become incredibly interested in not only, you know, the history of where zombie practice came from, but how it, it's evolved and manifested through yeah. film, you know, it's just, it's such an interesting topic. I feel like it's so much more interesting than any of the zombie movies are. You know, Dawn of the Dead is just a whole bunch of people getting murdered. And, but yes. within real zombie literature and practice and things, there's just so much more. They are not, there's no mindless killing. It's all very no. thought out. It's all very intentional. It's all very... Um, I mean, the rituals are, are very involved. 
there's a lot of commitment and devotion to the practice within real zombie literature. Yes, yes, I think so. And I think, again, it's talking about a lost, you know, herbalist art that I think has only now, again, begun to be something that people can talk about. Right. Yeah. It, uh, many of your African traditional religions throughout the book are, they're very earth-based. They're incredibly earth-based. They're based on, you know, working with animals, working with plants, working with the land that you're on, with land spirits. Um, and when we get into the serpent and the rainbow there, what I saw was a lot of um, herbal concoctions and poisons and things were poison um, and, and psychedelic plant matter and, and anima, animal matter. Were these, did these play a huge part in some of the African religions that led to our more North American African traditional religions? Yeah, definitely. I think so. I mean, I, I will also note that, you know, Wade Davis is an ethnobotanist, so I'm sure his questions were sort of geared to that to begin with, but there's always been a huge amount of herbalism because those were the native medicines that were available to the people, mm -hmm. you know, so there had to be a huge, this is what people could turn to, you know, for a whole bunch of different things, not just physical health, also spiritual health. So again, you we talk about witch doctors, we've got this concept of people that are functioning as doctors for the society for people who couldn't afford medical care for people that were you know not necessarily capable of taking advantage of whatever was available to other people what am i talking about i'm talking about people who might have chemical dependency people who might right. be sex workers people who might not you know that the whole list goes on just to everybody who couldn't get medical help or helped by a lot of these people you right. know and that's where the sort of doctoring came into it it wasn't necessarily that they were they were giving medicine. They were giving spiritual medicine, physical medicine from the stuff that was immediately in their surroundings. Absolutely. Um, in The Serpent and the Rainbow, the way he describes, um, so the way he describes the, the, the spiritual people, the, the, um, the Hungan who, who helps him, who tells him what the, the, the poison is, who, you know, gets it for him. Uh, his his spiritual house is full of people that need healing and that is mostly what he does the actual right. man doesn't touch any of the poisonous ingredients he doesn't mix up the poison himself but he mixes up the antidote after he mixes up the cure afterward he he deals with the healing afterward that was it's a huge part of the entire process was his work as a, as a healer that's fascinating yeah he was it, the book is really interesting for for people who haven't read it, The Serpent and the Rainbow by Wade Davis. Uh, super interesting, really, really cool book. Um, I also read a book called Tell My Horse by Zora Neale Hurston, uh, a very different book. It was similarly, she went to Haiti and she recorded what she saw there, but she recorded it as an initiate versus just an observer. She also wasn't focused specifically on the poisons. She was fo focused on the people. Whereas Wade Davis, as an ethnobotanist, was there to find out what the poison was. And you see, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you see this huge difference between the two books, the way the two authors approach the topic and, and what they share. Um, while Wade Davis, who is a, you know, no hate to Wade Davis, but he's a, he's a, he's a white boy from Canada, from the wealthiest municipality in Canada like the average household income there is four and a half million dollars uh in the place that Wade Davis came from he does not hold back in his book he tells you exactly what the ingredients are he tells you exactly the process of creation he tells you exactly what the spiritual um ritual is like whereas Zora Neale Hurston doesn't necessarily do that she tells you just enough and then she tells you that you don't need to know more and that you're never going to find out. Like she was holding it, she was holding back a little bit. Well, I think that's the responsible thing to do. I mean, what did Agreed. he do? He put it in the book and then he sold it to Hollywood to be this sensational film about, you know, yeah. what was the tagline? Don't bury me, I'm not dead yet. You know? Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's this, it's what, I mean, again, I know it's Hollywood, but we've just discussed how so many people still come to this tradition with ignorance and, mm -hmm. 
you know, uh, prejudice and things like that. So I'm, I'm glad that Zora Neale Hurston wrote about it. I'm sad that Wade Davis gets the credit for discovering, quote unquote, this zombie formula. It kind of reminds me about, you know, Columbus discovering America or Luke <laughs> Erickson discovering, you know, North yeah, America. The word has no okay. anymore. Like the word discover in this context, like it's lost all meaning. That's not what they did. <laughs> So what any well, yeah. people did. Who discovered it? Where'd you discover it? Somebody already knew it. Like yeah. you didn't invent it. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And I mean, to Wade Davis's credit, about two thirds through the book, he realizes that it's not just about the plants, the the yeah. poisonous toads, the poison. It is about the magic. And he's like, okay, I have to figure out what that is now. So to his credit, he f- kind of figures it out a little bit near the end there. Um, yeah, yeah. But I, I thought it was really interesting to just see how, um, how a Black person who understands that this information can be exploited and twisted and used to hurt Black people, how she approaches the topic versus how someone who never has to think about that approaches the topic. It was a really interesting difference between the two, I think. Definitely, you know, and she died penniless with most of her research, you know, locked away Mm -hmm. in her patron lady bountiful safe, you know, and it's still, I mean, again, recently we've seen a resurgence of some of that coming to light. We've, I wrote about her films. We've seen a resurgence of that. They're now available through the Smithsonian Mm -hmm. and uh, I think they're on YouTube too. But uh, so I think that that really needs to be seen, you know, that really needs to be spoken about you know i can't pass up this opportunity either to talk about my own uh haitian vodou mambo gro mambo priestess bonnie devlin who also went to harvard <laughs> like wade davis so and, many went uh, to harvard that's so interesting <laughs> yeah she was a fascinating ethnomusicologist and oh, very did a cool. lot of music therapy with people and you know again i feel like in some ways like marie Laveau, some of this gets lost you know, over time, Marie Laveau was such a philanthropic person who went and and did what she could to help the native people in the area and things like that. And I think that gets missed because people want to talk about death and people want to talk about, you know, hexes and curses and all that, you know, so. Yeah, it's getting a little bit more, uh, it's getting a little bit more popular to discuss some of the darker elements of of magic and I mean of life in general, of life in general. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I um, I'm glad I read both books. Like I, I, Wade Davis's book was was wonderful and entertaining, and then I read Tell My Horse, and it just added this this extra layer of context. Like I, I really recommend reading both to to everyone because I think, I think you just get, you just get more. You get two different perspectives, one from the inside and one from the outside, and it 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 shows you how beautiful and and powerful and and um compassionate that a lot of well I mean Haitian people and and Vodou is it's a very beautiful um you know it's a very beautiful very natural very compassionate religion and I think people miss that a lot because of all of our weird stereotypes about about Vodou well, yeah, I think people don't want to hear it. I mean, if anybody, I would also throw in Catherine Dunham's work in there. I mean, most people, again, know her as being a dancer, as establishing the Dunham technique. But again, she also traveled to Haiti and did, you know, ethnographic research on the sacred dance with the Loa in Haiti. Beautiful. And uh, you can find her films and her writings out there. I just want to say Island Possessed, I think. Yeah, I have to say the 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 music and the dancing element of African traditional religions is something that I just think is absolutely wonderful. It's wonderful. It's beautiful to see. It's beautiful to read about all of the different drum beats and songs and what they mean. It's just, it's incredible. It's, I think it's probably one of my, my favorite things that I've, I've learned about through our African traditional religions book. Yeah, it's powerful. It's powerful. And it was always a huge part of the tradition for mm-hmm. me, you know, and it's an honor that I could go on and do that in my work with Dr. John dancing and choreographing for him, you know, mm-hmm. so I think that, 
you know, right? That's what we're trying to do, right? Provide a counter narrative. There is this element of things that is going to be Hollywood and sensationalist. Mm -hmm. And then there's an element of realism that we can bring to the table. And hopefully people will make an informed choice. I hope they will. You know, I, I talked to quite a few um, non-spiritual people who are zombie movie fans uh, to ask them what they knew about the origin of zombies and, and, and you know, the context within voodoo and Vodo. And they didn't really know a lot. You know, there was this, this belief that any movies that featured zombies and voodoo, they were just a, a product of a very racist time. That, that yeah. all of that was sens sensationalized. And it's, it's sad to me that the, the reality of the practices and where zombie practices came from and the people that created them and used them, I think all of that is endlessly interesting, incredibly yeah. interesting. And I, uh, you know, I hope our conversation inspires some zombie fans to learn a little bit more and dig deeper. I, I think it's really cool. It is, it is. It's again, well, more fascinating. Reality is more fascinating than fiction in this particular. Yeah context yeah. fiction may have the the really wild and crazy stuff i guess but reality is i mean it's entertaining and it's endlessly weird people need to just give reality a chance i think if they're looking for weird yes <laughs> uh so let's say someone new wanted to create a zombie movie and they wanted to bring back the haitian voodoo zombie in a film or a tv show do you think that's something that could could happen these days? And, you know, what might you want to see in that? I think there is. You know what I mean? Again, I will preface this with if I turn around and see this somewhere, you know, <laughs> I'm available. For, you know, <laughs> I could go to film school. But uh, I would love to see something where there was an objectionable member of society, like, you know, we're talking about happens and somebody where they can't get, you know, I just watched a bunch of Lifetime movies, where they can't get. <laughs> <laughs> you know, somebody to believe them, you know, we hear the story all the time. Somebody's being stalked, somebody's being harassed, somebody's being abused, mm -hmm. and they can't get any kind of help through traditional means. So they turn to alternative means, you know, and alternative means, I think, in a really positive way could be turning to the spirit of the ancestors that knew some of these formulas, turning to ancestral religions that knew some of these social controls for people and allow somebody to have punishment equal to the crime through magical means. I would Absolutely. love to see that. I think that would be great. Uh, yeah. You know, as we're talking, I, it's like exactly the kind of movie that I want like Jordan Peele to make. Like, come on, man. Definitely. <laughs> it's right here. And you've already got this wonderful, you know, advisor that he can turn to. So if you right, need Jordan right. Peele. Netflix can pick it up. We'll put a bunch of trans people in it. Right. Like, come on, man. Let's just do the thing. Let's just get it out there. Yes. <laughs> I was bummed that I could not find more zombie entertainment that even mentioned voodoo like i even watched um eli roth's history of horror right yeah yeah eli roth he's so cute but i, I kind of hate when he talks and the word voodoo isn't mentioned at all in the episode on zombies and he refers to bella lugosi's character from white zombie as a hypnotist and i was like wow man you're exactly the kind of guy that i would think would know this stuff <laughs> yeah like it i feel like that's that's your job and it's uh, no people don't really know about it you know i mean heather green's new book lights camera witchcraft talks a little bit about witch doctors and zombies cool. for a few pages you know so that's interesting and i think there is a i hope i didn't get this wrong i believe there's a documentary called horror noir n-o-i-r-e mm -hmm. that interviews i didn't even know he was still alive the guy the black protagonist guy from night of the living dead and he yeah. talks about that element but again we're not talking about voodoo we're talking about this portraiture of otherness within yes. blackness within the cinematic context so that's yeah, yeah i would still I, like to see it you're right yeah, yeah he um he's a really interesting guy he's really he's really cool horror noir horror noir has the documentary and also a, a little podcast um and he did an episode with with keith david uh, and they were talking about, uh, I believe they were talking about The Thing, but Keith David is also the voice of Dr. Facilier in um, Princess and the Frog by Disney. 
and he don't is, get me started. Yeah, he is. He is the voodoo witch doctor in, in Princess and the Frog. And I forgot to ask this uh, last time we spoke, but the Princess and the Frog. I mean, how much of that, how much of what we see of Doctor Facilier is um, I don't want to say authentic or or real because that's not what Disney was going for. But how much of that is no, in is. in reality or whatever? Is it all just a completely fictional idea? I think the gi- the giant bulk of it is completely fictional. You know, I mean, I think the same way that the rest of these things sort of pick one tiny thing and drag it into the bottom. And uh, yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, the, the voodoo witch doctor vibe with the, you know, with the skulls hanging around and, and carrying a big staff full of whatever feathers and, and human remains, it seems like. Like it's all just human remains when it comes to this this image. This voodoo witch doctor image, is this... Is that based in reality at all? Are those the people that were creating zombies in Haiti? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> There's my short answer. Yeah, sorry, screaming Jay. Yeah. <laughs> There's a performative witch doctor that we see with Screaming Jay Hawkins that we see mm-hmm. even to some extent with Dr. John, you know, mm-hmm. and, and his sort of honoring through this dress. But I think, you know, with Mac, Dr. John, uh, that was his real name. A, I can't say it any other way, unfortunately. <laughs> With Mac, it was that he was also honoring New Orleans Mardi Gras Indian culture. So right. a lot of this sort of, again, feathers and finery that Mac incorporated did come from the those traditions here in this area. You know, when we look at Screaming Jay Hawkins, again, I think it was part of the image at the time, bits and pieces of things that we'd seen throughout this kind of Hollywood portraiture. And on some level, it represented a reclaiming yeah, And I think that that's an important point to make, the same way that in New Orleans we tried to reclaim the word voodoo, which for so long was a pejorative term. Mm-hmm. And you can see this even with witches, you know, yeah. people having, a, or brujas, people having a reclaiming moment with some of these words. And I think that's important. And I certainly see that's what we've got going on with somebody like Dr. John, who was a practitioner and did have, you know, practices that were in accordance with you know various different African traditional religions that's what I saw over the years you know and but that he could bring that through performance in this way and I think that there was also something ancestral that we see coming through with Screaming Jay Hawkins yeah that was able to present itself in this way yeah through that costume I mean he was able to be he was able to be outrageous. You know, before that, he was just, he had this beautiful, smooth crooner kind of voice. Um, and then when he became Screaming Jay Hawkins, I mean, he was allowed to do things with his voice no other singers were. He was allowed to sing about things that other singers weren't. He was allowed to sing about, you know, sexuality and about drinking and about death and murder and about whatever, because he had this kind of outrageous persona that he could work through. So it, was... it reminds me of some of these, car- sorry to interrupt you, it reminds no, me ahead. of some of these carnival uh, permutations, mm-hmm. you know, like I've, I've written about the Wailing Witch and the carnival in the Caribbean, who again mm-hmm. sort of dresses in this way and gets up before dawn and can say things that other people can't say. We have those images here in New Orleans with the Northside Skull and Bones gang who get up dressed in the skeleton and say things that you couldn't say under normal. So this kind of transformation, this literal masking, which I've written about a lot, that you can mask into something else where you can say the truth. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, to bring it back to to Simbi, who you mentioned earlier, who is a who is a deity from Haitian Vodou and other African religions, I noticed in the book, um, who was focused on magic and transformation and communication. In Wade Davis's book, someone refers to Simbi as the the master, the patron of the potions. This element of of kind of like rebirth of, of transformation of change and of silencing. All of that seems to really make a lot of sense with Simbi being our, our kind of patron of zombieism. So who, tell us a little bit more about, about Simbi, about who he is and how he factors into modern practice. 
Right. I mean, Simbi's got this element where they, you know, are like a snake. So for most mm-hmm. of the time, they're silent. There's no kind of noise or even movement or, or, you know, I've had snakes, you know, you walk in the room, you think they're dead half the time, you know? So, right. Absolutely. <laughs> you can't hear them coming either. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, been, you have moved in a week and a half, you know? Yeah. But then when they get food, they move with a lightning quickness. So there's this point of sort of conserving our magic for when we need it, conserving our energy, conserving our spirituality and honing it, strengthening it so that we can strike when we need to. And I think that's this element of Simbi. So, but there's also sort of ancient belief that Simbi has this moves in silence. You know, again, you, you mm-hmm. don't usually don't hear a noisy snake. Like <laughs> not really. It would have to be massive. Like, <laughs> yeah. Something would really have to be happening. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so there's this moving in silence. So there's this this element of moving in silence to strengthen yourselves to gain power magically. So again, when we see this zombie force, to me, it sort of really has this way of opposites, that it's, it's a transformation, a regeneration that allows, unleashes something in ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Simbi is a super interesting um, Super interesting deity. Yeah, we've had a lot of fun with Simbi. Here in my house, we had a Simbi thing once where we, you know, because he's communication, he's also technology now. So we did this thing where we, you know, like put mylar on the walls and like (laughs) made an altar out of the old hard drive. It was great. That's super fun. One of the last things I I wanted to ask is about Halloween specifically. Is there any, is there any sort of Halloween or um, death festival tradition in some of these African traditional religions that take place around this time? Is there a Halloween in our African traditional religions? I think only in the sense that it's over time been syncretized with All Saints Day and All Souls Day. Mm -hmm. So I do know people that do things according to that, ancestor offerings and things that time of year. But I would theorize, again, that means I'm not 100% sure, but I would theorize that that was something that happened more recently. Because when we look in West Africa, if we look at the Agungun masquerades and things like that for the ancestors, those happen earlier, kind of around, you know, harvest time, more Mm -hmm. like, so they happen more around September, end of August, you know, the yam festivals and things like that. So because the same way that the language and the indigenous is influenced, the the topography and the agriculture of the time influences things. So we're not doing things around this time unless we are going by a European calendar, because this, we don't have anything being harvested right now. That. Although in New Orleans, we still have stuff being harvested. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it works a little different in New Orleans. It's a very different, it's a whole, it's like a whole other part of the, the planet or something. Yeah, know? yeah, a whole other climate. <laughs> yes, yes. So, so uh, my house does things. The answer, cool. the short answer to that is my house does things at this time, just because spiritually this is, you know, seen as a time for ancestors anyway. Right. And All Saints Days and All Souls Days are when we do offerings not for our own just for our own beloved dead but also for the unnamed dead and and the baron and maman brigitte because they get syncretized as the sort of mother and father of all dead and that's how we honor them yeah and their images are are pretty popular around halloween as well just like our zombies and our or witch doctors, you see a lot of, you see a lot of the Baron all over at Halloween. He's, he's oh, kind definitely. of everywhere. Yeah. He's kind American of everywhere. American horror story has turned this into some sort of weird, you know, whatever. And then American gods, we've turned into oh, some my weird God. stuff lately. He was so hot in American gods. Like, I was like, <laughs> wow, this is really working. Like the uncomfortable sexual feelings I'm feeling are very appropriate for the Baron. <laughs> like, he was really... It was really beautiful. American gods really fucked me up there. <laughs> um, so that, that was most of what I had for you today. Is there anything else that you would like to, to tell everyone about African traditional religions or about um, voodoo or zombies specifically? No, just check out my blog, Voodoo Universe on Pathios. There's yeah. almost 700 posts on there. And uh, thanks everybody for checking out my books if they want to learn more. There's a whole bunch of them. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of them and they're all really good. <laughs> they're all Thank really you. good. Like uh, along Thank with you. along with uh, the book we've been talking about today, Arisha's Goddesses and Voodoo Queens is really great for anyone who wants to learn more about um, these traditions specifically. And also water 
The water magic book that you released, the water magic book that you released was so different from other books of water magic because there's this different root. It, it comes from these African traditions more so than some of the European ones that I've seen before. So that was really great. Thank you. I really wanted to include stuff, not just from indigenous people like Miguel Sage, but different practitioners all over the world, like mm -hmm. which Dr. Utu and, you know, my friend, the linguist, Allison, and, you know, it just, I wanted to include a bunch of different voices about water because water means something different to everybody. It really does. And, and, you know, there's so much out there. The elements, these are a kind of a basic thing we learn about in magic. So to have all of these very different perspectives and different ways of working with it and different stories was, I thought it was super refreshing. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So thank you so much for, uh, for being on the show today. Um, also, I hope you have a very happy Halloween. <laughs> I hope oh, you have some fun you. for Halloween. Uh, Same yeah. to you. Yeah, yeah. I'm dressing up. I'm going to a Dr. John theme party with his granddaughter who's on her way over here right now to give me the tickets to the party. So mm, That sounds excellent. I can already hear it in my head. <laughs> it's going to be wonderful. While there aren't many modern bits of zombie media that feature voodoo or credit magic with the creation of a zombie virus, there are definitely some new narratives that explore what happens to the zombies themselves versus only their victims. My favorite comedy show, just of all time, is Santa Clarita Diet, a Netflix original show. It stars Drew Barrymore as a woman who becomes a zombie, or as they prefer to say in the show, undead. And she tries to maintain her life as like a, you know, just like us. Soccer mom, she's a mom and a real estate agent, and now she can only eat human meat. <laughs> so it's a big change. Sheila Hammond, who is Barrymore's character, is a very timid and meek person at the beginning of the show who wishes she was stronger and bolder. And when she dies, it unlocks her id and destroys her inhibitions, and she gets her wish. She says, by dying, we get to be the people we've always wanted to be when describing why she likes being a zombie so much. So this is, this is a hallmark of the living undead in Santa Clarita diet. It's this feeling of supreme joy and fulfillment that they never felt they deserved in life. That they didn't have the courage to just be the, the person that would make them the happiest. So becoming undead is presented as, you know, the supreme freedom. And how different types of people use their freedom is an important and often hilarious plot point in the show. <laughs> uh, Santa Clarita Diet also has this very original and very detailed origin story for the zombie virus. Uh, it's not magical, and it doesn't come from Vodou. It comes from Serbia. But it's, it's still very great and, and something that is unique in, in zombie shows, I think. It also presents issues like, you know, the modern rise of neo-Nazis and shitty cops and men's rights advocates in this very hilarious and oh, incredibly satisfying way. Spoiler alert, some of them die. <laughs> uh, and it's so funny. Like, it's so funny. It's, it's really funny. Um, and I've watched the season now m multiple times, like at least four times all the way through, and I still laugh at every single joke. So, highly recommend. Another I really liked was iZombie. Uh, I just watched it this month for the very first time, but it was uh, produced by the CW in 2015 to 2019. And this features another woman who contracts the zombie virus and has to try to keep it a secret while maintaining her humanity and her human life. Something that stands out first is that in this show, the zombies very specifically eat brains and brains only. Fun fact. Very few zombie movies focus so specifically on brains. You heard us talking a little bit about it earlier. The first zombie movie that featured brains specifically was Return of the Living Dead, which was not made by George Romero, but, but his partner. The reason those zombies ate brains is because it made them feel good and eased their pain, according to the creator. Now, brains, of course, are filled with happy chemicals like dopamine and serotonin, and those definitely help us feel better and ease our pain. The next time 
media zombies ate brains in a big way was, you'll never guess, The Simpsons. (laughs) Treehouse of Horror episode number three, Dial Z for Zombie. When we imitate, you know, the slow zombies calling for brains, we're usually actually directly imitating that Simpsons episode in their version of zombies. <laughs> a lot of people don't even know that they're imitating the Simpsons specifically. Um, after that Simpsons episode, brains and zombies were like totally linked, even though it was never actually very popular in zombie movies themselves. <laughs> I thought that was wild. When I went looking for information for this episode, I thought I was going to find something so like interesting or weird about why zombies eat brains. And it was <laughs> to see that it was in large part the Simpsons really makes me laugh. Um, so back to iZombie. The undead in iZombie are physically able to eat regular food. In Santa Clarita, this is not the case. Sheila cannot even put food in her mouth. She will She'll throw it up and gag and etc. Um, but in Eye Zombie, they're physically able to eat regular food. But if they go without human brains, they begin to lose their human traits and devolve into the shuffling, rotting zombies that we've come to know and love, which they call going with full Romero. Again, hilarious. So what makes the show super interesting and different, besides its wonderful cast, very hilarious, is how the brains affect zombies. So when a zombie eats the brain of a single individual they begin to experience that person's memories and flashbacks, and they take on some of the personality traits of the brain donor. While zombification is spread via a virus that was unintentionally created by mixing a fancy designer drug with a very sketchy energy drink that causes psychosis and uncontrollable violence, the visions that are experienced are pure magic, and there's no scientific explanation explanation even attempted (laughs) to explain these visions. So our leading lady, whose name is Liv Moore, ha ha ha, uh, dropped out of med school after she was infected with the zombie virus and got a job at the morgue, where she has a constant supply of brains that she doesn't have to kill anyone to acquire. Brilliant, right? So she uses the visions to literally get into the heads of murder victims, solve the crime, and save the day. She works with with a police officer under the guise of being a psychic. And, I mean, with the visions, the way it appears, she appears like a real psychic. So again, we get a very clear origin for the zombie virus and even know how it eventually spreads to encompass the entire city of Seattle. But we also get an intimate look at how people on all sides of the situation hold on to their humanity, their families, and themselves. We see things like rich zombies getting bent out of shape about having to eat the brains of murdered homeless teens because then they might have to empathize with them. The horror. (laughs) We see a big difference between the zombies who now only see humans as a source of food and their precious memories as like a fun little drug trip. And then those who never forget that a real person had to die for that meal and that the lives and the relationships that they had built in their lifetime had real value. When word gets out, humans react much like we all expect they will, with fear and intolerance. But it's clear that the shoes that you, the viewer, are meant to walk in as you're watching it are those on the outside of society, not just zombies, but also those homeless kids, drug addicts, the mentally ill, sex workers, and others who've been exploited and victimized. Others who've been, you know, almost figuratively run out of town with by villagers with torches and pitchforks, but uh, in our in our modern social way. I also think it's interesting that both of these shows chose a woman to be their protagonist, and sometimes I notice that they even go out of their way to show that men who attain this kind of freedom, the zombie freedom, often will gleefully choose violence while our lady zombies specifically work to avoid being violent and instead save that power for when it's needed. So while both of these genders feel empowered and victimized by becoming a zombie, the men almost always go right out and use that power to victimize others, to perpetuate that cycle. 
And I think this is that's because this is how men are socialized to use and to gauge power. While women are taught to use their power to prevent the victimization of themselves and others. That's obviously very simplified and it doesn't apply to every individual person or character, of course. Um, but it's just, a, it's something I've noticed in both of these portrayals. And it's just a really interesting train of thought. What if in our zombie movies, only men were zombified? Would the damage and the carnage and, and, all of that, the, the killing, would that level still be the same? Would it change in any way? What if only women contracted the zombie virus? What would that look like? And would it look different? Going by these two, uh, these two shows and how they portray these zombies that hold on to their humanity, um, I would imagine that there'd be very different, very different worlds left after that. It's interesting, right? So in both of these portrayals, we're not watching a story featuring zombies. We're watching the stories of those zombies and how they work hard to become better people after their life is stolen from them. These two shows tell me that there is a place in the zombieverse for magic, justice, compassion, and stories about real people who don't just get to take the easy way out of the zombie apocalypse. They don't have the option of just seeing zombies as these inhuman monsters that they can shoot their way through with no remorse. There is a place for stories that make us think about what it means to be truly alive and what it means to be human in a very real, inhumane world. Thank you all for joining me tonight. And to Lilith Dorsey, of course, for joining us. So great. I am so glad I finally had the chance to learn more about zombies and their origins and about African traditional religions in general. It's a really interesting and beautiful topic that shows a different way of looking at and working with magic. And it expands our idea of what it means to be a magical practitioner, even if someone isn't necessarily a witch. I will be putting a list of Lilith's books and those that I read to, to research this episode in the description of the, the podcast episode, and I highly recommend checking them out. I hope you all have a fantastic Halloween, my witchy friends. I am honored that you chose to spend it here with me again on the show, exploring the mysteries and magic that have truly made this the season of the witch. If you want to find out more about me or the Fat Feminist Witch podcast, you can check out my website at thefatfeministwitch.com. You can also read my books, Green Witchcraft, The Grimoire Journal, and my newest book, Witchcraft for Emotional Wisdom, are all out anywhere that you buy your favorite witchy books. Green Witchcraft is about exploring the natural world through magic. The Grimoire Journal is a workbook to help you create your own spells and rituals. And Witchcraft for Emotional Wisdom is kind of a personal book about uh, healing from emotional pain and trauma and, you know, helping yourself be a little bit more happy through the use of magic. So you can find all of those. And if you go to my website, you can find links to get them uh, in both Canada and the U.S. Want to buy some Fat Feminist Witch swag? You can do that at my Tee Public store, which you can find the link for in the description to this podcast. I've got great t-shirts and tote bags and even small things like pillows and notebooks with Fat Feminist Witch artwork and logo, as well as new designs that I'm coming up with all the time. Most recently, I made some very fun fall and Halloween designs specifically for all of you fellow Halloween witches out there. For all of the book-loving witches out there, check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash thefatfeministwitch, where you can join our monthly book club. We get together every month and read new witchy books that are coming out with live meetups, um, fun discussions about the topics in the book, and even some, you know, spells and rituals that we all do together. You can find all of these links to find me in the description of the show or on my website.